Hey, good morning, and welcome to episode 67 of Talking to Artists. So uh, today we actually have something special because we have two episodes today. So um, at 11 o'clock, I am going to be talking to uh, Joanne from Remark Consulting. You may have remembered she was on a few months ago and she talked about um, really what was good for artists and how artists can help to build their business practice. Today, she's going to be talking about the other part of her business, which is actually in art consulting. So how to uh, build an art collection, how to buy art for a corporate environment, how to stage your work. And also, I'm sure there'll be some tips there for artists on how to kind of maybe to potentially create work that is appropriate for a corporate collection or what some of the limitations might be. Uh, at four o'clock today, I'll be doing Talking to Artists with Suzanne Clark. She is located in New Zealand, so it's uh, going to be eight o'clock. Uh, tomorrow for her time on the September 3rd, um, but four o'clock today. So I hope you can join me for uh, for two of those specials. Um, coming up, uh, just a couple of quick things. Um, as probably you guys know, we're working on uh, my family garden. My sister's here. We're putting some of the final touches on that show. So super excited about that. Um, opening September 15th to the 27th at Leicester Grove Gallery. So uh, we'll start to promote that because now we actually have enough pieces that are finished. <laughs> Everything was kind of pretty close. Um, and the weekend of the 11th, 12th is actually Cabbage Town, where both Helen and I will be there, as well as all of our cool artist friends. So anyway, I'm going to jump right in. It looks like Joanne has joined us. And so we're going to learn all about uh, what she can share with us. So Joanne is, oh, here she is. Hi, how are you? Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you again. You too. Oh, start my timer. <laughs> So I was just saying that uh, it's really uh, it's really cool to be able to kind of have this two part uh, kind of show with you kind of originally coming on talking about artists and how they can work with their practice and now really talking to art collectors and art lovers and how they can start to build a collection. Um, but maybe as always, we can start a little bit about you can talk a bit about your history for people that missed the first one, who you are, what you do, and then let's just jump right in. Let's just jump right in. Good, mor <laughs> good morning to all on a, on a beautiful morning. Um, so yes, um, my name is Joanne Pollock and I started my business Remark Art Consulting in 2010. Uh, I am located in Guelph um, and primarily I started out um, uh, selling art, um, acting as an intermediary for artists between uh, corporate clients and private clients that I had built up over time. Um, and so my business is multifaceted. Um, I do coaching and mentorship for artists. I do um, um, lots of lots of facets I'm involved with the arts greatly in 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 Guelph and and what's been happening is that that the business has taken on new tentacles um, has as COVID has forced people to um, to change direction in many respects so um, it's been a joyful a business I love what I do very much uh, I'm passionate and now it's jury season so I am into right. jurying three shows um, right at the moment. And uh, I'm, I have, I'm in the process of uh, setting up to teach another um, art business class to artists in the future, hopefully in October, um, whereby artists can learn about the business aspect of, of promoting themselves and branding themselves. So um, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a fast changing business. Well, and you know, it's obviously something we've talked about. It's something I'm really passionate about as well in helping artists with the business piece of the art so that they can actually promote more and sell more and make a living, healthy living from their art, which is something that uh, is kind of a dirty word sometimes in an artist's vocabulary, but is pretty important to actually put food on the table. <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the other side of your business because I, 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 I think it's something that... Um, you know, as artists, we're always kind of interested in, like, I, I would say that I'm an artist, but I'm also a collector. I have a lot of art, I don't know, 175 pieces of art. Um, although I can't say I've ever actually created a collection, like with the thought, thought behind it in terms of creating something that's a collection. So maybe would it be great if you could talk about the difference between how you start out to build a collection, how you build a, a collection with intent, I guess, um, and then what the difference would be in terms of residential or corporate or um, so yeah, so a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> a whole bunch of stuff. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm ready. And um, what I want to start out by saying, of course, is that human beings are by nature collectors. 
And so whether they collect um, um, stamps or postcards or vintage jewelry or shoes or funky ties or whatever, um, we, are, we do have a predilection to collect something. Um, and of course, um, for people that collect art, um, they do, in my opinion, uh, become quite addicted to the process. And when, once you buy yes. <laughs> your once you buy um, your first piece, um, usually you begin your journey. Um, so um, I wanted to make the point right off the bat that um, collecting art doesn't necessarily have to be a rich man's game. Um, and in, in many respects, um, you know, there are there are certainly are collectors that I have worked with that have extensive collections. Um, but more often than, than not, um, we're talking about people that perhaps buy their first piece of art rather unexpectedly. So they may go to an auction and, uh, and, and win, a, win a bid at an auction and have their first piece of art that way. Or maybe they are exposed to a friend who has some beautiful art in their home um, and and the the friend will say how how joyful it is to to be able to um, go to art fairs and begin to understand the art market, um, or 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 perhaps they just fall into it um, surreptitiously because um, um, you know they maybe it's something that the, the uh, a partner can do together as a family, and um, so you can start out by by having it become a really nice thing to do on a Saturday afternoon or a weekend uh, where you can go on a beautiful day and, and uh, enjoy the experience. Um, yeah, I, I was just say, I, I certainly find that as an artist is that a lot of times, you know, the beauty of something like an outdoor art show is that it's not quite as intimidating as going to a gallery. It can be a nice outing. And yeah, often I do find there are people that buy small pieces that we're not really kind of intending to do that they were intending just to have a nice afternoon out. <laughs> right and and sometimes it's um it's interesting that um husband and wives often have to discuss or compromise um because very often they may not agree on a piece but at the end of the day um there are always compromises no matter what what you do so um i i think it is um i think it is really um a, a wonderful pastime uh, for many people once they begin to get into it. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to talk, Kate, about, from my experience, some of the tips that I've learned over time uh, in working with perhaps novice collectors. Um, and the first thing I always tell people is that there are no wrongs in purchasing art. So a lot of people get caught up with the notion that, um, is this the right thing to buy? Um, should I buy it? Is it? Does it have value? Will it increase in value? Um, and and really, it's quite subjective, as we all know. Um, and there are lots of people that maybe buy um, on the spur of the moment, uh, and possibly have regrets that they did purchase it. Buyer's remorse. I've certainly come up with that uh, at times. Um, or um, the the flip side is that. Um, they are buying it just for the, uh, the pure enjoyment of having something beautiful in their home. So I want people to pause and be thoughtful about when they make their purchases um, because I want people to love it and I want people to love it forever. Mm -hmm. So I don't want people to look at art as something that is disposable. Um, and, I, and I recognize that happens uh, nowadays where um, you know, there, there's a whole different take on, on people that do collect. Yes, there are people that come from families, established families that have collected. Uh, and perhaps, you know, as a, as a young person growing up in a family like that, um, they are influenced about what they buy and perhaps they have a keener eye. But um, for the most part, um, you know, you're gonna make some goofs along the way as to what you buy. And over time, I've worked with collectors that have collected for 30 and 40 years. Um, and over time, um, they may not go back and, and be completely attracted to, to every piece that they've purchased. Um, but I think that- So is that, sorry, I just want to interrupt, I have a couple questions. So if you're, 
when you're saying that people go back and are not necessarily loving the pieces that they collected, is that because they were purchased with a thought uh, that it's going to be an investment? I guess that's my first question. And the second is, how can you, how can you determine um, well, how, which artists are going to be investment grade and which ones are not? Since so many artists don't really come into their, I guess, you know, reputation after they're dead. <laughs> like, it seems like an awful long wait. It seems like a bit of a crapshoot. Well, you can't. And, and, and in fact, I, I have had some people that have said to me, um, they want to buy for investment. And I say, um, become a dealer or, or talk to art experts that would be able to advise you about that. Because it's a bit of a crapshoot, Kate, as we all know. Um, there is no such thing as a guarantee for, for um, investment in art. Um, yes, it happens if you're playing in the bigger leagues, perhaps um, you have an opportunity to, to flip, your, flip your investment. But um, I don't believe in doing that necessarily. I believe that you should buy what you love because you love it. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the, the art world is fickle, as we all know. Um, it bounces greatly um, with the economy. And um, art, art is kind of one of the last things that, um, that um, you know, can go, can go south in, in a bad, well, the first thing that can go south in a, in a bad economy. Um, and so I, I do encourage people not to buy for investment um, unless they're getting into the big leagues. Um, and in that case, that's a different scenario. Um, yeah. I well, and presum pre sorry, presumably you have to have some pretty hefty change to do that because you're really already investing in artists that are established, that are already investment grade and you're hoping they'll go up. Like obviously if I could buy a little group of seven, it's going to be worth more probably, you know, 50 years from now, right? Maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll share with you um, a story about one uh, collector that I have worked with. And um, he collects to flip. He buys at auction regularly. And so um, he's, not, uh, he's not overly wealthy. But um, one of his friends in the 90s was going to auctions. And um, so Peter started to tag along and got caught the bug. And um, he decided that um, he, he, that's what he wanted to do. And um, he, he's quite open in saying that um, he, he's interested in the win. He's interested in the, if you can say, the, the, the sheer thrill of uh, making a profit on, on his artwork. And so that's quite different um, than, than a collector who buys and holds for the beauty of, of building a wonderful collection. Um, right. But, but nonetheless, um, you know, there are, there are people that go to the auction world all the time. Um, and there are no guarantees that the piece that you buy is going to increase in value. And, and, but it's, it's the thrill. It's like going to the casino. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I like it. And um, I've done my research. And I think that this can have value. And so mm -hmm. they buy it. Of course, the, the deal going to auction is that um, you do have to pay um, a buyer's premium. And, um, and so you have to make darn sure that what you're, what you're purchasing um, is really what you want. But sure, there are lots of collectors that um, go to auction. And in fact, I had the opportunity recently to meet Rob Cowley of Cowley Abbott in Toronto. It's, a, it's an auction house in Toronto. Um, and Rob was saying it's been a banner year um, for, mm. for the auction world. Uh, and, and he's never had a better year. So um, sure, there are, there are people that become more savvy and um, get, into, get into the game um, that way. But um, that's a different scenario than people that yeah. are, are, are trying to build up a, a nice collection on a limited budget. Yeah, so maybe let's talk about that because I agree. It almost really is. Those people are are investors. They could be day traders. They could be horse. You know, they could follow the horse track. It's it's almost not really. Art just happens to be their drug of choice versus them loving art and really surrounding themselves with art in their home. So maybe we can start off right at the very bottom. Like if you're kind of uh, just really starting out, and I know for myself, I I see people just starting out who are. Some of them have just graduated from university. They've got their first apartment, and now they want to make it personal. 
I also see other people that have just spent millions on a gorgeous, huge renovation. And this is the first time in their lives they're buying a real piece of art. Um, so anyway, maybe talk through a bit of that process and how to, how to judge as an abstract painter. One of the questions I often get as an, as an artist is, but how do I know that it's good? Like, you know, if I, if I look at something realistic, I can see that the proportions are right and I can see that it's a good piece of art. With abstract painting or things that are a bit more conceptual, uh, people seem to have a bit of a hard time navigating if it's good or not. So, so the, the first thing that I, I would encourage people to do is to not buy right away. So um, look, look, look. So begin to attend um, art shows, art fairs, um, do, do your research online. If you find, of course, Instagram, there's an artist that you like on Instagram, begin to follow the artist, uh, understand what they're doing. Um, and then it's worth a visit when you become uh, more, more comfortable to begin to um, establish a relationship with an artist and begin to get to know them. Very important in my opinion, um, because of course, for a, for a buyer, they want to know the artist story. They want to know the background. They want to know um, if they can feel confident. If the artist has a track record of selling, uh, then, then the buyer feels more comfortable in saying, okay, I'm not buying, you know, a piece of art from a, an artist that's painted for, you know, three weeks. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's I think it's really important to build up a relationship with an artist, and and that takes time, and that takes research, and um, you know you don't have to pull the trigger right away. Um, just educate yourself and learn uh, about what you like, um, and trust your taste, trust your instinct. Um, so so yeah so so I, and the flip side of that then I guess as an artist it's important to remember that like that not everybody is ready to buy when you see them at an outdoor show or something but to give everybody that the right amount of time and authentic energy to kind of share your vision um, and start to build those relationships because it's not gonna critical. you're not gonna sell out your booth in your first art show right <laughs> critical Kate and and you know that very well yourself that um you know, the best way to sell art is to begin to build relationships with clients. And mm -hmm. what you find, and I'm sure you can speak with this personally, um, is, is that you will have repeat clients that will come back to you because they have built a nice relationship with you. You've been, you've been gracious, you've been accommodating, you're, uh, you're pleasant to work with. Um, and invariably, they will come back um, and, and purchase a second or third piece or whatever. Um, yeah. and, and, and so um, I can't stress that enough, that it is very important um, for a collector to establish a relationship um, with the artist. Um, the other thing is that um, I talk and encourage um, buyers and collectors to keep their eye on um, young graduates. So MFA grads, um, um, students that have been more formally trained um, and maybe, maybe on the up and up. For example, and you know, um, the, Tor the um, Toronto Artist Project in February, there is the back wall there. Um, yeah, untapped. Where um, I, know, I know many collectors make a beeline to that back wall first. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and they are trying to suss out um, what artists they think may fly um, and do well. And so, you know, again, there is, there is no a given as to who's gonna fly and who isn't. Um, but I worked with a collector recently who um, bought something at the art fair and um, the artist went on to win the RBC um, prize the following year. And of course they were on their way to, to, um, to an art career. So, right. You know, it, it, it's important to remember those young people that are starting out. There are several galleries in Toronto that are very good at uh, recognizing um, uh, young talent and are willing to promote. To promote. So again, um, when people start to jump into the art world and understand um, what's going on, I think that it's it's fair um, to trust those um, art galleries that are in the know with young people 
and have been around more than once so that they, they know perhaps um, who's, who's going to fly a little bit. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and I, and I do, and I do tell um, my clients that um, certainly you can wade in with prints. So if you can't afford original works, which is fair, um, there's nothing wrong with prints. And many people build up beautiful print collections. Um, but the only thing I will caution people is to buy limited edition prints. Um, and so, of course, you don't want to be buying a print with a, a run of 2,500. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, want, you, want, you want to um, make sure that you're selective in, in what you're buying. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with prints. And in many, th and in many instances, I think it's great um, for, for novice uh, collectors to start with prints. Um, and that, that gives them confidence in perhaps moving into a higher end. Now, I know some people, too, that just speaking about prints, they, they actually, that does become their collection specialty or works on paper. So some of them are going to be, you know, monoprints that were are kind of original one-offs, but others would be, like you said, limited edition signed prints or artist proofs or something. So is that something that you think people kind of fall into? Is it something that a more sophisticated artist or collector will start to kind of go, yeah, I'm really, there's something about works on paper that I love versus paintings or sculptures or whatever? Well, I think it's a personal preference at the end of the day. Um, and, and, and it is about what you grow to love um, as part of, of your collection. So if, if prints are your thing and you really get into it, um, it's an exciting aspect of buying art as well. And, um, and, and it, it can be very pleasurable. But, and that doesn't mean that you just have to buy prints forever. But I think prints are a way of wading in with confidence um, into, into being a collector and, um, and recognizing that your tastes are going to change over time. And, yeah, I was just going to say that. I think that for, certainly I look at my own collection um, and, you know, I think that it, I've become a bit more, um, I won't say sophisticated, but I think that, that the work I like tends to be become more abstract than realistic. So I've got stuff that, they, that I bought at the beginning of our collection that I may not love quite as much. So I guess that is a nice way of being able to surround yourself with, with pieces like prints that aren't super expensive and see whether or not they hold up. Because I think that's the other thing too, is that if it's in your living room, you're looking at it every day for the next 50 years. So it's got to be something that continues to sort of draw you in and make you think about the work. Well, that's the idea. Um, and we've all, we've all made mistakes. Um, we've all bought things um, maybe impulsively or th at the moment, um, or maybe we had a friend with us and they think, oh gosh, that would look fabulous in your home or whatever, whatever, whatever. And we've all been caught doing that. There's no question about that. Um, but if you begin to become more thoughtful about what you are buying, and particularly if you're going to move into a higher end market, um, then you you will become more thoughtful in what you're buying. Um, and, and, and as I said, I've worked with collectors, some collectors that have been collecting for 30 years or longer. Um, they have amassed beautiful collections. And in some cases, um, there's a gentleman that I, a lovely collector that I've worked with um, in Kitchener Waterloo, who has at least 500 pieces of art in his home, um, and not all high end art. He's the spectrum. He runs. He's very yeah. supportive of the arts community. He knows the artists in the community that he lives in, and if he if he likes a $500 piece of art, he will buy it. Um, and and so I think I think he's got it right. Um, yeah. And his home is joyful. And when I met him and I, and I was first invited into his home, he couldn't wait to take me on a tour. <laughs> That's and, great. <laughs> and he wanted to show me in depth. Um, and I was happy to do it because I love art as much as he does. But he wanted to show me every piece and why he bought it. And he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very well-established professional businessman. And um, he said that by day, he does what he does by night. He goes on his computer and he looks at art all the time. And it, it, it's, that's, his, that's his joy. That's his, um, that's his thing. 
Um, and it was really a wonderful opportunity to spend time with him. He had some of his collection in storage because he couldn't possibly put it all out, but he was a very eclectic collector. Um, he collected African um, stone sculpture. Uh, he collected rare books. Um, uh, you know, he collected a, a number of different things, uh, other types of sculpture. And so the, the, in viewing the collection, it was very rich. It was, um, it was lovely. It, some of the pieces stopped me in my tracks because he was so um, excited and proud of the things that he had purchased. And there were stories behind all of them. So for example, the African um, stone sculpture that he had collected, it was really a, quite a process. He had, uh, he had gone to Africa and had uh, met some um, African stone artists and wanted to support them and went through an incredibly difficult process in getting the works shipped to Canada. But nonetheless, um, they are spectacular and, and it brings him so much joy and they are truly beautiful. Yeah, that's, so. that's actually wonderful. It's, I know a couple of people who have had collections that are quite extensive and they actually have written a book because the collections themselves are beautiful, but what makes it so amazing is really the stories behind collecting and how you found that artist and the relationships you have and what it means to you, which is a pretty impressive thing. The, the, I mean, we can't help when we're talking about collectors, we can't help not talk about um, um, uh, Henry and Dorothy Vogel. Um, and, uh, and, and the Vogels were uh, very modest people in, um, uh, in, uh, on the east side in Manhattan. And they started, he was a postal worker and she was a librarian and they lived in rent control housing in New York. This would have been in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So very modest income, two mm -hmm. bedroom apartment. And what they did was spend every dime on art. And they, they would go around on Saturdays and Sundays, their weekends, this was their joy. And they would um, get to know the artists. They would negotiate with the artist if they had to pay on installment, that's what they worked out but they only bought what they could either take home on the subway or take home in a cab. But <laughs> what ended up happening was that um, they, they collected for years and they, th their art collection was 4,700 pieces at the end of the day. Wow. It was all stashed in their apartment. So it was in closets, it was under beds, it was everywhere. Um, but they were selective. They had a mission that they wanted to collect art, um, post-war art that was culturally um, uh, uh, exciting at the time. So they ended up meeting artists that were, um, that went on to bigger and better things, you know, no question about that. Um, at the end of the day, um, Henry is now dead, Dorothy is still alive, but at the end of the day, they donated their collection to the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Um, it is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow. And, um, and, the, and they, they, chose to, they, they chose to donate the art um, to the National Gallery in Washington because A, the National Gallery does not charge admission to go to the museum. So they wanted, they wanted to have their artwork in a place where it would be accessible to everybody. And the, the museum, um, when they took in the pieces, they were committed to not ever selling the pieces again. So um, they stayed as a collection, as a full collection, basically. Right, so they, yeah. they, I mean, these guys, in my opinion, had it right. They were not wealthy, um, but they were savvy. And, and they were, this is what they did in their pastime. They, they loved art and they got to love art even more over time. And um, it just goes to show you, Kate, um, that, you know, if you, if you begin to enjoy it and become committed, it does become an addiction. There's no, there's no yeah. question about that, right? 
Well, I think the other thing that it shows too, because a lot of people will kind of say, oh, I don't have any more room for art. But the reality is obviously, because I think I've seen pictures of their apartment. It was floor to ceiling and it was just stunning um, and such an experience. So there's always room for art. And I know one of the, actually the first, the very first person who ever bought from me at my very first outdoor show, um, he came, he's, he used to come quite regularly to all the outdoor shows, but um, he had, was to the point where he could only buy small pieces because he literally had floor to ceiling art. But what he would do is he would actually trade it with his friends. So at one point he would say, oh, your, your piece is now in Florence, Italy, because I just gave it to a friend of mine. He's going to have it for six months and we're going to trade the art around, which I think is a wonderful way of refreshing your collection by allowing you to continue to buy, <laughs> I know, which is fun. I think it's, I think it's wonderful too. Um, if I can share my experience with my very first collector, um, it was a woman in the city and uh, I just got a call out of the blue and she said to me that she was at a point in her life where things were more financially stable and um, that her friends, many of her friends collected art and she, her words to me were, you know, I, I think I just want to collect art and, and know more about it. And so I went to her home and um, we had a discussion about um, what, she, what she thought she wanted to do. And her budget was very modest. Her budget was $800. And even at that, um, she was, you know, thinking Pushing about it. it. Yeah. And um, I said, that's okay. And um, so we, we, we went on a journey together where we bought her first piece of art for her dining room. And I tried to talk about the value of buying original art and um, what, it, what kind of a difference it can make in your home. So she was very satisfied with her first piece of art and she decided she wanted a second piece for about her fireplace. And from that moment on, that woman became fully enchanted with art. And, That's cool. Uh, and she has gone on to purchase probably 25 pieces of art from me over the span of 10 years. And it was funny because initially she said, I'll tell you the things that I don't want. So don't show me any abstract. I don't understand it. You know, don't show me any goofy, funny, you know, weird stuff. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not interested in that. So I thought, okay, you know, you respect your client. And I thought, okay, I'll be gentle. And, um, but I knew in my heart that I was going to take her on a journey where she would end up um, understanding a little bit more the art market. And, uh, and of course, I did talk her into abstracted works, which <laughs> she loves. And, yeah. um, and she, her, her, her words back to me are, of course, um, every time somebody comes into her home, um, she can't wait to talk about the art and, and, and she, she will go to a gallery and, and perhaps I've sold her um, a piece from an artist that is in a gallery and she's like, oh my God, I know that artist. I have that <laughs> in my collection. That's um, very cool. So it's really, it's really cool. And it was, um, it was such a pleasure for me to um, take her on a journey. Like I would take her to art studios or I would find something that I knew she would enjoy. Um, yeah. And so I would say, are you open to taking a look at this? She always said yes. Um, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't and that was okay. Um, mm -hmm. I was never pushy about stuff and I always respected her budget. Um, and she went on to, of course, um, spend more and more money on art as she became more confident. But, um, but I think that's, I think, sorry, I, I think that's also a really a good way of doing it where it's a little bit of exposure, exposure therapy. Like you need to see a lot of art to be able to kind of figure out what your internal color palette is and to internalize what you like, even if you didn't know you were going to like it at the beginning of the journey, right? Well, of course, we all know that, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't encourage people to buy art to match the sofa, the same old story, right? And, um, and from my point of view, and I'm not an interior direct decorator, I am an art consultant. 
um, from my point of view, it's always about the art. Um, and, and the art is the focal point in, in your room. Uh, and it should be. And um, perhaps my feeling is the reverse, where um, you buy a stunning piece of art that's gorgeous, and then you, you can build your room around it if that's what you need to do. But, you know, interior decorators come at it from the reverse perspective, um, where they, their priority, of course, is, is furnishings and drapery and so on. And um, usually there's not that much money left. Um, when the job is finished and therefore there's a minuscule budget for art um, and that's their priority. So that's not the way I yeah. work. I, I really no. work on, I work on the basis that, you know, um, if you buy good art, it looks good. I agree. And I think it's always a, a challenge um, because as an artist, you hear it a lot. You know, it's like, you know, it doesn't match the couch and that always seems to be the classic thing. And I think it's a, it's a shame on a number of cases because the reality is you'll probably have your art for 50 years. It'll be handed down in the family. You're probably going to have your couch for 10 years. So it definitely seems reversed. But the other thing is I've, for me as an artist, I've sort of wrapped my head around is I do think that people have an internalized color palette. So the couch is probably part of a color palette that they like, which is probably also going to kind of fit the art um, so I think you kind of, as an artist, if you're a working artist, you kind of almost have to get, wrap your head around that because I do think it's still a lot of people feel like the art has to be complementary and match something else that's in the room. Well, we're in Canada. And so, you know, we, we, we live in, for six months of the year, we live in a gray world. Um, and I'm always surprised at the lack of um, confidence in, in, people to have put more color on their wall for enjoyment. Um, yeah. You know, people tend to be very um, nervous about color in their home. Oh, you know, they don't want things too bold. They, they're, they're very muted um, and, and downplayed. Um, and I don't understand that at all because um, I, <laughs> yeah. have, I, I, I am all about color in my world and uh, but I, rec I recognize not everybody is like that but um but I do think it comes down to confidence like I think as long you know you have these beautifully designed homes and designers do an amazing job I'm not saying they don't but I think there becomes this this philosophy that for your home to be comfortable it has to be very tranquil and very neutral and I kind of think that you know I like my home to do also have something that gives you a a pop of joy or pop of happiness or unexpectedness as I'm walking through my home, right? For sure. Um, and I do think it's hard if you're a, a, a novice collector to break out of, this is what the designers are telling me. This is what I'm seeing in the design magazines. This is what I'm seeing in Home and Garden and their gorgeous spaces, uh, but to break out of that and, and do something bright. And I find interestingly for people that I work with often, it's because they've seen something in a friend's house where they're like, oh, that bright red painting on that white wall looks amazing. And I feel comfortable. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I had a lovely experience a number of years ago. I had a young woman that contacted me and um, I think she came from an art loving family to begin with. But anyway, she, um, her first child was about to turn one years of age. And she approached me and said that she wanted to buy a piece of art every year um, for her son to build up a little art collection. And um, that was fun because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, she, it, her, but she's a young person. They're a young couple. They're saddled with a mortgage and, and you know, re financial responsibilities. But nonetheless, I was touched by the fact um, that she did want to introduce to her son um art into his life and that would be a forever thing that absolutely I've, d I've done that with my kids as well i started when they were 10 buying pieces of art for them um and now they have their own i think my son was probably one of the few people that went to university residence with his 10 pieces of art um <laughs> and my daughter is quite addicted now to these online square foot shows and she's got quite a, a quite a remarkable collection already at the age of you know 26 but it's pretty neat to see how they build their own preferences and ideas and colors and their collection is different than my collection that's sure. super cool um you know young people i i was watching um or listening to a podcast on artsy the other day 
about um, new gen new gen buyers, new gen collectors, um, and how they are uh, maneuvering in buying art. And of course, I think it was 92% uh, of new collectors um, that are within a certain age period are buying online, uh, click and buy, um, and that's what they're doing. And it's yeah. not that they're buying inexpensive art. Um, they, they have done their research, they know what they like, and they're not adverse to spending money on a decent piece of art. Um, but that's a staggering um, uh, percentage of the population, the art buying population, mm -hmm. um, that is not going into a gallery um, or some other venue where they are able to purchase art. So, you know, artists need to be very savvy with um, setting up e-commerce um, if you really want to stay in, in the game of, of selling art. Um, yeah. there, are, there are older clients who um, are perhaps not as comfortable in being able to buy without seeing and touching and, and, and that physical emotional connection. And that's fine too. Um, because that's going to keep art galleries in business. But um, I, I think there is a significant um, movement away from um, buying art uh, in a physical sense. And I think what we may end up with is a hybrid of people that do both. That yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like, I think it's the same as, you know, when online banking first was introduced, there were people that were never going to do that. They didn't trust it. They went into their bank branch. They knew their bank manager. And I think as you become comfortable with something, it, you know, it, it becomes ubiquitous. And I think with this generation, they do so much more online and they've always done it online. That really buying art is not that different. Right. So and, they've and done in the past. They're very savvy. I mean, these, yeah. these it may be a situation where um, they bought their first, first piece of art at an auction or they, 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 you know, they became exposed to someone that did collect art. And um, if you're into it, you're into it. I mean, if you, yeah. if, if you, and, and the more that you get into uh, buying art, the better it gets because um, you do want to go to those um, outdoor shows. You do want to see what's new. Um, you do want to meet new artists. Um, and you do want to see new things. So, yeah. um, right, I, 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 I don't think, I'm not saying that that will go away, Kate. I'm just saying that um, there is a huge percentage of young people who are buying online and will continue to do that. I agree. And I think older people will too. I think it's becoming like, you know, there are sometimes I want to go to the mall and I want to shop for something. There's sometimes I want to go online and I want to shop for something. And I think there's going to be, I agree with you that, that both of that hybrid model. So um, another question, if you are a collector, you've been collecting for a number of years, you've got a large collection um, and maybe now your tastes are starting to change. Um, how, how do you recommend, I don't know, culling the collection or getting rid of pieces you don't want anymore or, um, or do you just kind of continue to keep them and store them under the bed? <laughs> right? Well, of course, that's that that's a huge problem, and certainly for um, older collectors, I have to tell you that I get calls sometimes a couple of times a week uh, from you know maybe the grandma's passed away or mother's passed away or whatever, or they don't like what they bought twenty years ago, and what do they do with it? You know, it's a I I don't have an easy answer for that um, b because. Um, stuff that your mother bought 30, 40 years ago, um, and you remember seeing that painting on the wall when you were growing up as a kid, and, um, and you have some kind of emotional attachment to it. Your mother certainly had an emotional attachment to it. Um, but in terms of um, at the secondary market, in my case, and trying to sell that stuff, um, not promising and you know when i was talking to um the auction um chap last week and he said you know like robert bateman um print prints would be twenty dollars um there's wow. just, or trisha romance there's just no value there's no modern um value for for people to want that stuff because everybody had it right 
So, um, yeah, taste change, but lesson learned, try and buy um, what you what you think you're going to keep for a long time. And yeah, your kids will not share your same taste. My daughter doesn't share the same taste that I do. Um, and that's okay. But I always encourage her to buy well. So yeah. if she can't afford to buy something, um, hold back. Or maybe you can buy a print. Maybe you can do something another way. Just don't end up am amassing a bunch of mishmash stuff that you're not happy with. And 10 years from now, you say, well, I want to I want to get rid of this because I don't like it anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's a problem. And I guess it's also a problem if you're looking at inheritance. You know, I mean, I'm a collector. My kids are collectors. My parents are, are collectors, um, partially because my grandmother was an artist, you know. So at some point, too, you just, even if you love the art, you physically truly have too much art for your home or if you're downsizing. So is there a way of, or are, is it recommended to try and place value in an art collection if it's part of an estate or do you just kind of figure it out? Or is it kind of the same questions you just answered where it's just, <laughs> there's not really a good answer. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a recent experience too. I worked with a, with a family in Guelph who um, had inherited that. So the, the, the family was quite prominent in the community and now the artwork um, had been given to the nephew and um, the nephew had it stored in his basement, <laughs> which was not ideal. No. Um, but anyway, so the nephew didn't really have a clue about what he had and was it of value and what to do with it. And so um, I took it to a certified appraiser and uh, I, came, I came back and said to him, um, this is what I think you have. This is the value. Um, there are condition issues because you haven't looked after it properly. There's all kinds of problems. It's been in damp spaces. Um, oh, and that's just sad. At, at the end of the day, because he, he didn't have a clue what he had. Um, at the end of the day, he's like, I'm just going to keep it. And I said, fine, but don't keep it in the basement. <laughs> yeah. Put it on your wall so you can at least enjoy it. Um, he didn't have any children. Um, I, so at the end of the day, I don't know what will happen to that stuff. But um, art should not be in basements. Um, art should be enjoyed. And, yeah. um, and it, 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 you know, he had some things of um, significance. And he didn't know that. And um, he toyed with the... So I just said, you know, um, make sure that things are insured properly through your insurance policy um, in the event that something does happen. But um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, enjoy it for heaven's sakes. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Um, right. And what's the difference between if you're building a personal collection versus a, a corporate collection? Like I see you also work with corporations. We don't have very much time, but I'd just be interested in understanding if the philosophy is different there. Well, the philosophy is, is different. And unfortunately, the corporate world is not collecting art the way they used to. Um, so banks that have um, in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s and 90s, and they were collecting very fine uh, artwork from Canadian uh, artists, and they were spending a lot of money. The Thompson family, for example, was heavily invested in the Canadian art market. Uh, and, and banks and other corporate people were uh, building up wonderful collections. That is not the case anymore. Um, and in fact, we're going in the reverse direction where many corporations and banks are deaccessioning um, their collection. So it's not optimistic um, for um, the outlook for um, corporate people to, to buy high-end art anymore. Sad to say, um, but true. And that is the reality. And uh, many banks are deaccessioning, as are some um, uh, corporates. And um, again, you know, what do you do with this stuff? Where does it go? Who wants it? Um, mm -hmm. And so, so people like myself or people that I work with have to find um, a donor that is willing to 
take the work and give the bank um, a tax receipt. So that the but that's what's in it for the bank um, is that right. they want they want a tax receipt. So, you know, the Thompson family um, spent millions. I sat behind at an auction at Sotheby's a number of years ago. Um, members of the Thompson family who were spending millions of dollars um, on artwork. And um, that's not the case anymore. In fact, Sotheby's does not even uh, sell art in Canada anymore. So mm. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different ball game right now. And um, sad because um, that was one way for artists to um, have prominence with, with their work in fabulous and good collections, but that's not the case anymore. Right. Oh, that, yeah, that is sad. But, you know, things are cyclical. Maybe that will come back and change again. <laughs> maybe. I just wanted to touch on, Kate, because um, I, I get asked, and maybe you do too, about what people are buying and are there trends in what they are buying. Um, mm -hmm. And so, for sure, um, I, I, I go back to uh, biophilia art, which was a term that was coined in Vancouver on the West Coast. Um, but biophilia art is about that people are seeking calm in their lives and they're looking for artwork um, that is peaceful and will take them back to nature and back to a, a peaceful place in this world of chaos that we're currently living in. So there is that tranquility aspect of what people are looking for. Um, after the African art market is extremely hot. It's been sizzling for a long time now uh, since Black Lives Matter movement got off the ground. Um, and so black, black art is very hot. Um, and many collectors are introducing uh, black artists into their collection to fill the gaps that perhaps they didn't, they weren't exposed to before. Um, mm. And the other thing is Aboriginal art um, in Canada, and again, with all the issues, with the residential issues going on, uh, Aboriginal artists and everybody's seen it, um, they are having much more of a, a, a center stage in Canadian art. They are given opportunities. Um, I just um, noticed the other day, there is a young couple, Aboriginal couple, they're two women um, that are setting up an Aboriginal gallery in Toronto. Um, and so, you know, collectors are, are, if they're looking to build an extensive collection and you want to have a collection of interest, um, then these are, these are things that perhaps you can think about in filling, um, backfilling in your collection. But mm -hmm. we live in Canada. And so, you know, rocks, lakes, and trees, um, and mountains uh, in Canada are always, always sell. And yes. they always will be. <laughs> And florals yeah. will always be popular because they are easily understood um, and, and people enjoy the beauty of florals or Canadian landscape. So those are easy sells. Um, but in order to build a collection of interest, um, perhaps you do have to broaden out a little bit and venture into things like an interesting Aboriginal artist um, or a young Black artist that is doing great things. And many of them are. Um, it's just that they haven't been given the opportunity to get on the stage yet, but they will, yeah. they will. Um, and when they do, um, savvy art collectors will take a second look and think about uh, buying a piece from them. Yeah, we just had she uh, just closed at the Lester Grove Gallery. We had an Indigenous uh, show, I think sold six pieces or seven pieces, lots of interest. And remarkable work that was just uh, very different than what you kind of traditionally see. So that was well, really wonderful. And yeah. we have a mosaic show there now, which is also also kind of interesting where mosaics and using different, I don't know, different elements and stuff to kind of create. It's kind of interesting to see. Well, I did have the pleasure a while ago of interviewing Christy Belcourt. Um, Christy, of course, is a, is a Governor General Award winner in Canada several times, actually. Um, and Christie's work is is incredible. Um, it's it's detailed, and she very much is able to express her her dearly held values in her world. Um, mm -hmm. And and she's been given she's been given recognition and recognition outside of Canada. Um, she's had opportunities now internationally to show her work. But you know, for the average um, person 
that perhaps hasn't been exposed to um, Aboriginal art. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. It's, uh, it's incredibly beautiful and detailed and meaningful. Um, and, and I think people just need to um, educate themselves and understand it a little bit more. It makes the, your world so much more interesting um, when you can appreciate different points of view. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, this has been fabulous. And so basically, want to build a collection? Buy what you love, do the research, meet the artists, um, just trust your own instincts of what you love as opposed to always having to have that external uh, feedback. And if you're really struggling, reach out to Joanne and she will help you. <laughs> so maybe you can let her, let her know your contact information. I mean, you can, you can, honestly, you can, you can, you know, if you have five grand, um, and you can, you can start out. I mean, I would love to help you um, start slow. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't rush anybody into a collection because that is the joy of collecting is to take your time uh, and expose yourself to lots of, lots of different things and begin to build over time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, I've really appreciated this chat. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And of course, Great. I really, and so this, of course, will become on, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and eventually a uh, podcast. So lots of great information. Awesome. Well, thank so you. So thanks so much. Continued success in, uh, in Toronto and elsewhere. Thank you. All right. Well, have a great day. Thank you. You too, Kate. <laughs> thanks. Bye-bye. Um, goodbye. And so coming up again, reminder that at 4 p.m., uh, I'm going to be talking to Suzanne Clark, who is an abstract painter. Uh, we've got Michael Wills, who is, um, he's read an interesting professional hockey player to artists, some really great stuff, um, uh, very kind of uh, dynamic and lots of energy. And then James Fowler, who uh, has probably best known for a lot of his uh, very detailed maps that he's kind of creates his map art, which are kind of lovely. So anyway, so have a great day and we will talk to you all later. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.